Hello, BookTube. Well, here we are in our very first meeting of uh, my very first totally independent read-along uh, for Anthony Trollope's 1865 novel, Can You Forgive Her? Uh, the last read-along that I did was guided, at least at the beginning, by the guys at Strip Cover Lit. They started, they did a, a read-along of uh, The Fellowship of the Ring, and I, I joined in. And then when they were done, I sort of had my launch already made to do the return of uh, the two towers and the return of the king. Uh, but this is the first one I've ever done on my own. Uh, and it's, so we're going to be feeling our way along to find out exactly how we want to do it. And it would be a little bit rough, I'm sure at the beginning. Uh, but for now, I thought I would begin just by talking a little about this book. Uh, this, I have the art the new Oxford world classics paperback just cause it's so lovely. Uh, and the people at Oxford are nice enough to send me the whole of the set. Uh, but any, anything will do. It doesn't, this book, you know, really doesn't require notes. Uh, although we'll get into some notes, I'm sure, as we go along. There are some mentions that, that are worth it. Uh, but uh, when I say the set, I mean, of course, the Palliser novels, or what's sometimes called the parliamentary novels. Trollope's uh, set of more or less political novels, although there are a couple of them that don't have much to do with politics. This is the first of them, uh, in which we meet some characters that he is going to pursue close up or at a distance for the next six books. Uh, but it, even so, having said that, you shouldn't think of this as the first installment in the series because it, it, it isn't made that way. Trollope said later in his life, 10 years after he wrote this, uh, that he knew some of these characters intimately well and intended to pursue them through many books. But the market was the ultimate arbiter. He didn't know one way or another. Uh, and it it makes the whole thing a little more intimidating than it needs to be if you think of it that way. So you shouldn't. Uh, but this was written... Uh, when Trollope was already a well-known, established name in the literary world, he was at the, the height of his fame uh, up until this point. In, and it's important to, re to remember when you're reading this that you're reading the work of a practiced past master of writing novels. By the time Trollope wrote this book, all but one of his Barchester novels, for instance, had already been published. Uh, and he got more money for this book than he'd ever got for anything or ever was to get for the rest of his career. He got a mind boggling amount of money for his day. Uh, so you go into this novel. I mean, you, you don't have to care one way or another, but if you do, you can go into this novel knowing that you are going into a book uh, that's not the author feeling his way anymore. This is it, it, And I believe that shows in virtually every chapter uh, that this is an author who knows what he's doing. And he's in complete control of, of the tools by which he's going to do it. Uh, but uh, we, for today, are reading the first 20 chapters of Can You Forgive Her? And in those 20 chapters, we are basically told the story of three women. Uh, there's Alice Vavasor, who is a, a young woman, lives in London with her distant, non-committal father, uh, one of the, the kind of civil servant parasite, uh, feckless tyrant at the dinner tables that Trollope loved to satirize. And, and Mr. Vavasor, John Vavasor is a, a perfect example of that. He's he, the only reason that he's indifferent to his daughter, completely indifferent to her. He certainly doesn't love her, but the only reason he's indifferent to anything that she does or says is because her family members, the, the family of her deceased mother settled her financial fortune on her. They gave her complete control of it, not him. It, you get the sense over and over again, even in these first 20 chapters, that if he had control of her money, not only would it be gone, not only would she not see any of it, but he would be, you know, a dictator to her. But as it is, every time she does anything that he's even remotely disagreeable to him, one of the first things he says is, well, your fortune's your own. <laughs> as if that matters. So he pretty much abdicates his parental role. So, so we get an Alice Vavasor who is not controlled by anyone, uh, except distantly by social conventions and by the, the rich relatives on her mother's side of the family. And she scorns both of those things. Uh, she had, in the past, before this novel starts, entertained the idea of having a, a, a relationship, a marriage, with her first cousin, George. Uh, but then they broke it off and uh, it, nothing came of it. All the relatives were against it. 
as we'll see, we'll see why. <laughs> and, and in the immediate forerunner to this book, she is engaged to marry uh, a Cambridgeshire gentleman named John Gray, who is completely upright. He's the soul of propriety. He reads the right books. He, he lives by his means. His means are not ample, but they are uh, totally sufficient to keep his house and grounds and garden in the countryside. Doesn't, doesn't have a house in London, doesn't, doesn't come to London except on business, has, at, when we first meet him in this book, has no ambitions to a parliamentary career or anything else. Just wants to be a country gentleman, a completely respectable country gentleman. And uh, has succeeded in winning from Alice Vavasor a promise of marriage when the book starts. The other two women are, uh, on the one hand, uh, Alice's aunt Greeno, Arabella Greeno, who, when she was 30, married a man twice her age who was very wealthy and who promptly died. <laughs> and she was a good wife to him, much to the amazement of her friends and her family. And now, when we meet her, is a widow deep in widow's weeds, wearing deep black and, and face masks and everything, but all of it extremely fashionably made. All of it meant to be very flattering. So there's a, a right from the beginning with Aunt Greeno, there's a, a, a strong tint of hypocrisy. Uh, and yet, the characters who know her, for instance, uh, George's sister, Kate, who will, she's a major agitator in the plot, so we'll get to know her quite a bit, uh, and also Alice herself, no one thinks completely poorly of Arabella Greenow. They, they know that she's a fake. She, they know that she's a hypocrite. But everyone talks about her forthrightness, her honesty, even about her own hypocrisy. Uh, and she's played for laughs quite a bit. Troll is very good at that. When, when she, every time she mentions her dead husband, we get the strong impression that there was no love there. But every time she mentions him, the crocodile tears start flowing. And then she starts saying that her only happiness has just gone into the grave. <laughs> uh, we don't get the very strong impression. We never meet her husband. We don't, we don't get the very strong impression that he ever made her happy. Uh, but she very much likes having his money. She very much likes being independent. And if there's a, a slight smear of disreputable opportunism to that, well, she's the first one to dismiss it. As she tells, uh, as she tells Alice at one point, in I think the, the, the 20 chapters that we're reading here, she comes right out and says, money is never dirty, nor is the means by which you make it. What she means is that money is freedom, and she has a great deal of money, so she is free to go to the seaside, which is what she does in the chapters that we're reading here, and entertain suitors. <laughs> totally of her own will, and the men will come flocking because she's still relatively young, she's still good-looking, and she has a large amount of money at her private disposal. Uh, and the third woman we meet, talk about a large amount of money, the third woman we meet is uh, Glencora McCluskey, who is referred to in these 20 chapters as a golden child, a child of the gold mines. A, a hint that she comes from new world money, from new money. But one way or another, she is loaded to the gills with royal relatives, <laughs> all sorts of royal relatives, a, a uh, converse of them, a, a board of royal relatives, essentially, who uh, viewed her as, a, as an extremely marriageable item. And she has an enormous amount of private money settled on her. And a strong will, when we meet her, Trollope mentions twice in two pages that she loves to toss her hair in fits of pique. Uh, she, she's strong-willed, but we get the impression she's not all that bright. She's just very fiery. Uh, and by the same token that Alice Vavasor's moneyed relatives on her mother's side disapproved of her threatened relationship with her cousin George, by the same token, the, the, the great people, as Trollope calls them, uh, on Glencora's family, very much disapprove of a relationship that looms in her own future when she becomes head over heels in love with uh, a beautiful boy named Burgo Fitzgerald, who also came from a stack of no noble relatives and also once upon a time had a vast fortune settled on him, but he's a spendthrift and a, a, a brainless idiot and has long since gone through all that money. So he has duchesses for, and, and countesses for aunts and people suspect he doesn't work, of course. He just floats from meal to meal and fox race to fox hunting course to fox hunting course. Uh, and people just suspect that his 
noble relatives give him money. Either that or that he's loaning himself out to money to money lenders, always in Trollope's world called the Jews, uh, that they might be his best friends. But one way or another, Glencora's family is horrified at the prospect that she might marry this man and that he might gain control of her fortune and immediately spend it all. And they're even more horrified when they realize that she's in love with him. So they come down hard on her in scenes that we don't get. Trollope doesn't, they, they are outside, they are offstage, they are before this book. They come down hard on her to convince her to marry the nephew and heir of a great lord, a man named Plantagenet Palliser, who works in Parliament, who stands to inherit, but who is all about service to his country. And uh, we've met him before. Assiduous readers of Trollope will already know him because he's in the small house at Arlington and he's uh, in that book, uh, what we would nowadays call a drip. <laughs> he's he's colorless, he's bland, he's totally devoted to duty, he has no sense of humor, he has not the smallest touch of romance, he can't even make small talk. Uh, in other words, death. To be promised to such a man if you are a fiery spirit like Glencora, and yet she agrees. She knuckles under to the pressure of her family, and she marries Plantagenet Palliser. The marriage takes place offstage in the chapters that we're reading today. But she never loses her infatuation for Burgo Fitzgerald, and she confesses all of this to Alice Vavasor. They are briefly friends. Uh, and it's those three women for these 20 chapters whose adventures we mostly follow. Uh, there are a couple of other women. We've already mentioned uh, George's uh, sister Kate, who is deeply fired up for her brother. She is she is at his disposal. She's his servant. She wants him to go into Parliament. She wants him to succeed in life, and she's willing to lay her own life on the line to do that. And she thinks one of the best ways for him to, to succeed would be for him to revive his relationship with Alice and marry her. She's in possession of a small, a small amount of money on her own that could come in handy for George in a race for Parliament. And in these first 20 chapters, we get a, a couple of priceless uh, scenes with George talking with local grubby election fixer men about a possible race that he might enter. And it's, it's Trollope hates those kind of people, and yet they're all through his, his political novels, because they have to be. Uh, and so Kate is one of the periphery women that we get, and the other one is, uh, is not so important. Her name is, is Lady McLeod. She's uh, a busybody old relative of Alice's who's constantly harping at her to do the right thing and who is the emissary between the the countesses and, and moneyed ladies in Alice's that side of the family and Alice herself. They never talk with her. Uh, they, they talk with her through letters and through Lady McLeod. One of the letters is great. <laughs> One of the letters is uh, from Lady Midlothian who, who uh, writes that I, I she writes, Dear Miss Vavasor, because of course she's never met her cousin. She still feels the right to tell her what to do, especially when she when rumor reaches her ear that of this impossible decision on Alice's part not to marry John Gray. Uh, it, early on in the book, through, through slow, almost foggy stages, Alice decides that that life would be deadly. She looks at her own version of marrying Planned Pageant Plowser. She looks at her own version of marrying a totally respectable, completely unexciting man who she does not love. And unlike Lady Glencora, she decides not to do it. There's no one to tell her not to. There's no one to control her. She decides that she's going to tell him, no, I can't be your wife. I don't think I would make you happy. Uh, and she gets a letter in the mail. And I, Trollope's letters are always great. I wanted to read a bit of it to you. Uh, uh, she, her, her cousin, Lady Midlothian, uh, who's not really a cousin, it's just distant, distant gets, tells her, we learned that you were going to marry this man, John Gray, and we're all in favor of that. He's eminently respectable. We've looked into him, very key. We've looked into him, and we find that he's totally respectable. And then she goes on, you may feel how dreadfully we were dismayed when we were told by dear Lady MacLeod that you had told Mr. Gray that you intended to change your mind. My dear Miss Vavasor, can this be true? There are things in which a young lady has no right to change her mind after it is once made up, and certainly when a young lady has accepted a gentleman, that is one of them. He cannot legally make you become his wife, but he has a right to claim you before God and man. Have you considered that he has probably furnished his house in consequence of his intended marriage, and perhaps in compliance with your own especial wishes? Have you reflected on that he has, of course, told all his friends? 
Have you any reason to give? I am told none. Uh, nothing could ever have been done. Should, nothing should ever be done without a reason, much less a thing as this, which is, is uh, in which your own interests and, I may say, respectability are involved. I hope you will think of this before you persist in destroying your own happiness and perhaps that of a very worthy man. And then she goes on because there's a rumor floating around and it's going to involve our, our story very much so. I had heard some years ago, when you were much younger, that you had become imprudently attached in another direction. And with a gentleman with none of those qualities to recommend him would speak so highly for Mr. Gray. It would grieve me very much, as it would also grieve all of your, all of your other, you know, moneyed lady friends, who in this matter thinks exactly as I do. If I were led to suppose that your rejection of Mr. Gray had been caused by any renewal of that project, Nothing, my dear Miss Vavasor, could be more unfortunate, and I might also add a stronger word. <laughs> of course, this letter has the opposite effect of what's intended. If it was, if you were ever going to make Alice Vavasor change her mind about this new thought that has returned to her brain, that's not the way to do it. Uh, and that is the sort of the setup of the 20 chapters that we're reading now it's they are mainly concerned with introducing our characters and creating the world in which they live the story of these three women uh it's pretty clear in the first 20 chapters that the story of aunt greenow is going to be told mostly for jokes mostly mostly for comic relief when she goes to the seaside with kate in tow because kate doesn't have any money and wants to enjoy herself, and the easiest way to do that is to stick with a relative who has 40,000 pounds. So she goes as a sort of a lady's companion for Aunt Greenow, and the minute they get to the seaside, Aunt Greenow is besieged by suitors, and the two of them, <laughs> the two of them who lead the pack, are two great comic creations of, of Trollops. One is a farmer <laughs> uh, who has an estate at... at oily mead <laughs> he's he's a very prosperous farmer and uh he fancies her and in order to impress her when he takes her to his his farm he shows her everything all the eggs all the new cream he shows her the, the manure pile <laughs> that he's very proud of <laughs> and the other is a totally impecunious liar of uh, a cashiered army captain who who is the minute he gets a chance is happy to lie about the extent of his service. He's kind of a Falstaff figure and who can't, doesn't have two pennies to rub together as the farmer. They're, they're sort of faux friends, but they actually, they actually hate each other. And the farmer is happy to point out to Aunt Greenow that the captain doesn't even own the coat that he wears. Whereas as the farmer is constantly saying he owns everything, everything of his, his own completely outright. I won't owe a man another penny. <laughs> uh, and because these two suitors are so buffoonish, and because uh, Aunt Greenow needs almost no provo provocation whatsoever to dab her eye and talk about her lost, loved lord, you're supposed to, you learn pretty early on, that you're supposed to chuckle a bit at this whole subplot. Uh, uh, so on the one hand, we have this, this woman who has done the right thing. She, she married a man she didn't love, and was dutiful to him and he died and she got his money. She did what society expects of her and now she's free. But she's also free to play and that's what we see her doing with these suitors. She doesn't need a man in her life. She could continue to be a respectable widow with enough money to make her comfortable for the rest of her life easily. But uh, she's one aspect of this trio. And then uh, the the second aspect, the one that's in the in the background for now, she, she'll come forward later in the book, is Lady Glencora, who in these chapters is married. Alice Vavasor is completely certain that she is not happily married and doubts that she and her husband are even friends, much less in love with each other. But nevertheless, she's the wife of Plantagenet Palliser. She is the wife of an heir of the heir to uh, the Duke of Omnium which is a vastly wealthy estate, almost as wealthy as the money that she comes from herself. She's not prominent in these early pages. Instead, the beginning of the book is given to Alice Vavasor, who has a small amount of money of her own, enough to be independent, lives with her father, but is not in any way under his authority, and has a kind of unfocused yearning to do more 
to be more. She doesn't know what it is. She knows all sorts of, of, of intellectual ladies in London who are talking about women's suffrage and women's causes, and she doesn't really have any interest in any of those. She's not really interested in Parliament or the goings-on of politics. She doesn't know what it is, but she, she has a feeling that if she retires to Cambridgeshire with John Gray and becomes his wife, although she will want for nothing, she will, in a sense, die. Whereas her cousin George is has at least an air of unpredictable excitement about him that attracts her, even though I don't think the man himself attracts her. And that's small wonder, because we get a good portrait of, of uh, George Vavasor in these pages, and it's not a good portrait at all. Not only because Trollope makes the rather obvious choice to make him scarred. He has a vivid scar down, down one side of his face that becomes more vivid and brighter when he's angry, and he's angry a lot. <laughs> so, he, so in the one sense, you have this Caliban-like figure. He's not... He's not attractive in any way. He's secretive without having anything interesting to, to withhold as a secret. Nobody knows where he lives. His, he was prosperous in the wine trade, but fought with his partners physically. Uh, he was engaged to marry a wealthy heiress, but she died and uh, before they could marry and her money could become his. And now he's sort of a speculating man in the city, but has no good reputation. No one speaks well of him. Uh, and no one really knows him. No one knows where he is, where he spends his time, how he speaks. Uh, so it's not just that he's a little reserved and maybe a little self-conscious because of what he looks like. It's all that, that he's not pleasant. He's not a nice guy. <laughs> we, we get enough about him easily to know that, uh, that we can't expect anything of him. Whereas we're told over and over again that John Gray of Nethercoats <laughs> is a nice guy that he's a little superior, he's a little too nice. Alice Vavasor's father at one point uh, is one of the only judgments that he ever that he ever relates to. Another character that seems right says that, yeah, he's, he's too good for his own boots. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, he seems completely nice, and he's devoted to Alice, and she says that she loves him. She never changes that declaration. She never says she doesn't love him. But there comes a scene in these first 20 chapters where she she has to tell him I'm afraid I have to put off our marriage indefinitely. In fact, I have to tell you privately that I'm canceling it. I don't believe I, that I would make you happy as your wife. And John Gray takes it in stride in a way that, again, unconsciously is designed to infuriate her. He basically tells her that she's just having a mental fit, <laughs> that she's not in her right mind, and, and that if she'll just get away from the city, get away from other temptations, other thoughts, maybe go somewhere for a little while, until the fit passes, she'll see the nonsense of what she's saying. He says that he will wait. And her, her father, when he hears when she, when she tells him the story, thinks she's just flat out insane. Wants nothing to do with and and tells her, if John Gray comes to me, I'll tell him. I think you're insane. I think this whole thing is insane. Of course, you should be. She should be your wife. Uh, but John Gray doesn't isn't angry for a minute. Instead, he is too understanding. He tells her, you're not in your right mind, I will wait. And uh, that's that's kind of where we leave things. We, we end with a chapter called, Which Will It Be? And that, that, is, that is the end of where these 20 chapters lead off. And uh, the, the one strong observation that I wanted to make, and I also want to open it up as a question, because again, keep in mind, I'm feeling my way with a read-along. I'm not sure how we'll do this. I know I want a lot of interaction. But it's kind of hard when I'm talking on a video and the interactions aren't going to happen in videos. Uh, I would invite those of you who have BookTube channels to make reaction videos to your first to the first twenty chapters of this book. And try and stick to that, and just tell me, tell your view, your readers, your viewers, what you thought of these first twenty chapters, especially if this is your first trial. Of. That I especially want to know. Uh, so it's a little awkward that to to ask for reactions, but nevertheless, I'll give you some of mine, and I want some of yours. And reading these twenty chapters again for the, for this read along. Uh, the thing I was struck by is how few likable characters there are <laughs> and how that's a sign that you know that you're dealing with an author who is not only at the height of his powers so that he doesn't have he doesn't feel the need to give you something that will keep you reading he knows that he can do that but also uh, to dig a little deeper you also get the feeling from that that you're dealing with an author who's already built up a readership 
right? If an author has fans, then they can get away with things that they can't get away with if they're brand new. So here, Trollope can give us 20 chapters full of either ridiculous or unlikable people. And I, I mean that almost right down the line. <laughs> I mean, Mr. Vavasor is contemptible. He, he complains to every... He, his job is a few weeks out of the year to go to an office and sign uh, account books. Without reading them, he's not supposed to check them or anything. He's just supposed to sign his name. And he considers himself poorly used. And every successive government that comes in, he writes them begging to be excused from his job, but keep his full pay. And every single government, Tory and liberal, says, you can be excused from your job, but if you are, you get half pay. <laughs> you get half pay for the rest of your life for doing literally nothing. But if, if you want your full pay, you have to go in a few weeks a year and sign your name. <laughs> and he considers that abuse. So we're not supposed to like him at all. And Kate is a, a conniver. Oh, we're not supposed to like her either. And George, oh, cousin George with his huge scar down his face. No, we're not supposed to like him. You don't trust him. You don't believe in him. You don't believe him when he says things that haven't been corroborated by the narrator. You don't believe him. Uh, but there's also John Gray, th that worthy gentleman from Nethercoats. We get the impression that there's no air in, in the room anywhere around him. The exact opposite of, for instance, a, a, a potential counterpart of his in, for instance, Jane Austen. Pic picture a, a small, relatively prosperous landowner in Jane Austen. They breathe personality, but not, not John Gray. No, he reads the right books. He reads the right periodicals. He has the right ideas. He'll be totally devoted to his wife, and neither she nor he will ever experience a moment of excitement. Uh, so you can't really like him. You can't disapprove of him, but you can't like him. Uh, and I don't know what to say about Arabella Green now. I would love it if Trollope had written a novel about her life that maybe ended with the death of her husband instead of beginning after her husband is dead. That, uh, but as it is, she's mercenary, and she has no bones about it. That at least is likable, but her two suitors are ridiculous. <laughs> uh, and the whole comic opera that they go through is likewise ridiculous. Uh, no, the, the, uh, and then there's Alice. Then there's Alice Vavasor, the main character of this book, the woman who is the subject of Can You Forgive Her? She's the her. <laughs> uh, can you forgive her for jilting the man that she agreed to marry? For telling him after months, no, this isn't going to happen. I've changed my mind. Uh, in a less assured novelist, we would expect to sympathize with her. And in fact, in these 20 chapters, Trollope says that he's already forgiven her and that he hopes you will too. Alice isn't particularly likable. <laughs> She's a twit. It's, there are no high principles guiding her in her decision either to jilt John Gray or to resume relations with her cousin George. There are no principles of any kind, high or low. It's, it's what led uh, one, one famous uh, wag at the time of the book to say that the title should be Can You Stand Her? <laughs> uh, She's not a heroine in any way, in any normal sense of the word for a Victorian novel. She's not a heroine. And uh, in these first 20 chapters, if we read them without knowing the rest of the book, if you've never read it before, you have to wonder, is she going to change? Is any of this going to change? Is she going to, to deepen as a character? No, the only exception in terms of likability, the only character in these 20 chapters that you can actually completely like is Lady Glencora, who's completely honest. She admits that she doesn't love her husband, and she admits that she made the decision at the behest of her family, at the powerful members of her family. And when we meet her, the few scenes that we see her in in these early chapters, we like her. She's written with more spirit than all the other characters put together. So even if you didn't know anything about her, even if you didn't know anything about what Trollope later writes about these books, which is that he was in love with Lady Glenn from the beginning, you would be able to feel it, I think, in these early chapters. Or at least, that's what I think, and I want to know what you think. What did you think? When you read these 20 chapters... Did you like any of these characters? I mean, some of it will just clashes against the 20th century or the 21st century completely. I mean, in some ways, this is a completely Victorian novel where women are expected to marry for reasons other than love, for reasons other than personal predilection, where money means something so different from what it does now that it might as well be an, an alien tractor beam of some kind. Uh, so, of course, I want to know all of that, especially for those of you who aren't familiar with reading Victorian fiction. But... Uh, I mainly want to know who you liked 
in these 20 chapters? Who intrigues you the most? You know by now, when you've got to the end of these 20 chapters, that Trollope shifts his narrative emphasis from person to person, you know, according to rules in his own mind, from chapter to chapter. By the end of chapter 20, who did you find yourself wishing would be the subject of the next chapter? Who did you want to read more about? Uh, stuff like that is the kind of stuff that I'm very much interested in. Now, next, that brings us to the end of this first chunk. We're going to read this book in one month. So uh, we're going to do 20, it's 80 chapters. So we're going to do 20 chapters a week, uh, which means that the uh, for next weekend, uh, let me get to the, uh, the breakdown here. Uh, for next weekend, we're going to start with uh, the chapter, Alice is Taught to Grow Upwards Toward the Light. Ominous named chapter. We're going to start with that, chapter 21, and we're going to go to the end of the first volume, this was originally printed there, chapter 40, which is Mrs. Greenow's Little Dinner in the Close. Uh, so we're going to read, we'll read those 20 chapters for next weekend. Uh, and we'll just uh, push our way along. <laughs> so, so uh, thematically, those are my main questions. Who did you like, if anybody? Who did you dislike and why? What are you making of how Troll presents these characters? Uh, but I also, as a side note, if you feel like it in your comments, I would love to know how you're reading this book. Did you go out and buy a paperback? Did you download an electronic version? And if so, which? Uh, are, are you reading it all the time? Is it your main book? Are you carrying it with you? Uh, that sort of thing. Are you keeping notes as you go along? It's, I, I'd, I'd love to hear from each one of you where this falls in your experience. Is it your first Victoria novel? Is it your first Trollope novel? I'd love to hear all of that. Uh, all sorts of things that we would talk about if we were doing this here at Hyde Cottage in a room over calzones and wine as God intended, but instead we're not. So, so, we're, uh, so I'm feeling my way along figuring out how to do this. So that that is it for uh, meeting number one of Can You Forgive Steve Donahue? And then we will move on next uh, next weekend. We'll move on to the next 20 chapters. So I will, I will wrap this up for now, and I'll see you all then. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube.